Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the third day of the State of the Art of Architecture in Triennale di Milano. Uh, it's an exhibition which is organized by Joseph Grima, as well as uh, Lorenzo Baroncelli, Sarah Herda, uh, with the help also of Sofia Pia Belenki. And uh, I'm very pleased to be able to uh, just speak a little bit today um, to moderate and to introduce some of the practices which are going to show their work today. So the exhibition, uh, which officially opens tomorrow to the public, is um, a collection of 38 of the most exciting young practices in architecture in the world, uh, who were invited on the idea of confronting sort of what are the new issues or what are the new forms of practice or uh, questions or forms of collaboration that are potentially interesting for the future of architecture. Um, there's a quite interesting format actually where uh, each studio has kind of brought some little microcosm or form of representation or um, kind of fragment of their practice uh, and installed it in this kind of uh, very intense uh, <laughs> circular format, half circle, so that you kind of can uh, go through one by one and see a very, very brief glimpse into uh, each practice. But at the same time, uh, these three days, there's also been the opportunity for each practice to do a kind of performance or introduction or a kind of overview of their work um, that kind of brings out more of the elements than can just be visible in uh, the kind of individual works on the table. So uh, today we have a lovely lineup of, of groups, uh, starting with Studio Ossidiana, who I will introduce in a moment, uh, followed by Marian van Albo, uh, Cosmos Center for Spatial Technology, and uh, MBL Architect. Uh, and there will be two more sessions also later in the day, starting at 2 p.m. and at 4.30, uh, which you're always welcome to join. So I am very pleased to welcome the first practice, uh, Studio Sidiana, uh, which is a practice of Alessandro Covini and Giovanni Bellotti. Uh, they are living in Rotterdam, uh, where uh, they are also um, doing many, many projects and awarded the Prix de Rome, um, where they had an installation in the New Institute, um, showing kind of uh, different proposals for Amsterdam and for, uh, you will see the uh, kind of project, I think they will install a bit here, so if anybody sitting here wants to come more close to see the, the installation, um, you're very welcome to move a bit further this way. All right, good job. Thank you, Tamar, for a really nice introduction, and uh, like we're very happy to be exhibiting here in Trennale with this amazing group of other practices. And uh, yeah, we are Alessandra and Giovanni, and we run Studio Sidiana, with, and uh, yeah, our practice is based in Rotterdam and started in 2015. And uh, yeah, Studio Sidiana is the two of, two of us. And then uh, like depending uh, by the projects we're working on, we work also with uh, like a team that varies between uh, two or five, eight people. And uh, like the work we do and uh, the researches and commission we have are mainly like projects between public space and public art. Uh, and uh, today we would like to uh, introduce uh, some like, themes we're interested in through some projects that we're currently working on. Uh, and then we will present uh, like, uh, the project called Amsterdam Allegories that Tamar just uh, mentioned, uh, which is uh, quite important for us because uh, it really shaped our method and uh, set up a sort of agenda for our studio. And uh, like uh, in our work, uh, like we want to design spaces uh, that asks uh, for action and transformation, and uh, which are an invitation to engage. So this is uh, like uh, uh, a playground that we just uh, finished close to Utrecht, and uh, it is a project that uh, could foster children's imagination and could uh, uh, could be a space for children to invent stories uh, and rules for playing. And uh, playing has uh, quite an important dimension for us because uh, it is both an action and uh, it is itself a form of design. Uh, the moment when children, adults, but also other animals uh, abstract and recreate uh, the world and uh, the relation towards it and, uh, and each other. And uh, speaking of other kinds, can you hear me? Speaking of other kinds of engagement, this is, uh, I hope it's visible on the screen because we have a strange glare here. This is a project we're working on for Alme, which is this new town close to Amsterdam, uh, which is built on reclaimed land in a place where there was the sea until 50 years ago. We call it the fire dune, and it's, a, it's an artificial sand dune which is populated by a series of by variations on a fireplace. So one of them is a vast portal, one of them is a crater which transforms the dune into a volcano. One of them is a kitchen with ovens for cooking and barbecuing, protected from the wind. And it's something uh, between a sand garden, 
to be maintained and sort of cultivated and kept, and a very big stove where the hand uh, heats up as all the fires are lit together. Uh, we are currently working on we're, another theme we're working on, and uh, that is becoming has become quite important for us this year is actually a research on a series of objects and spaces that mediate the relation between uh, uh, people and other animals. And this is a project that started with a, uh, a bench for our parrot who lives in our office, who's called Coco, uh, but evolved in a bigger investigation really on the different kinds of relations between spe species. And for us, it's uh, increasingly blurring in the line between utilitarian and uh, ritual relations, but also between sentimental and caloric exchanges with other animals. And again, here for us, the act of playing comes, uh, uh, comes in the design, in the sense that it becomes a form of language uh, between species, sort of a communication mediated by objects. Oh, sorry. And we work quite a lot with, uh, through material investigation. In the playground, it was part of a research on concrete and somewhere between craft and uh, industrialization and prefabrication which was done in collaboration with manufacturers. Well, when we began to think about these cases for birds and humans, we also began to develop a material vocabulary for it, which uh, uses ingredients from horticulture, uh, so made of hemp, of earth, of expanded clay, uh, salt, uh, seeds, charcoal, spices for pigments, uh, so all materials that can be eaten or chipped. So these mixtures that we use for some of the objects are cast soils, and they almost require our horticultural approach to design, but also to the fabrication of them, and certainly to the maintenance. And at the scale we work on, which is uh, between object and installation, for us it's actually quite interesting because it gives a um, chance to really address the material culture of the projects, and to also address a bit of a problem that we think architecture has with material culture and sort of, in a way, to embed narratives in the very fabric of uh, what we do, of what we cast and design. And uh, the project that we would like to present today is called uh, Amsterdam Allegories, as we were saying. And uh, the project was a two-phase competition and with which we won uh, the Dutch Prix de Rome. And uh, this competition is held every four years and uh, has always been a space for speculative uh, proposals. So it gives a site, and in this case, uh, the site was in the north of Amsterdam, but explicitly asks for experimental concepts. So it has no clients, but speaks to a broader public. And uh, like we approached it uh, as a chance uh, to give form to a series of ideas and hopes and uh, like a sort of pragmatic manifesto for a way of being, do of, uh, like being together and thinking of public spaces uh, and its rituals. Uh, so Amsterdam Allegories is a, pro a proposal for a site which is called the Six Haven, which is a triangular island in the north of Amsterdam on the waters of this uh, large canal river I, which is opposite uh, the central station. And uh, like the project uh, responded to the theme of high pressure and uh, to a place of uh, raising, uh, raising land values, uh, growing cities, uh, to a pressure that is uh, social, economical, environmental. Uh, and they were also asking to develop a non-consumptive program. And f f Amsterdam for centuries has been expanded towards south, towards the, on the Amstel River, which gives it its name, but today it's uh, increasingly looking north. And for us, the beginning of the story was that Amsterdam is becoming the city on the River Eye. And the River Eye is becoming, as the architect Piet Blom said um, some years ago, is becoming the Grand Canal of Amsterdam. So between the two shores, we began to see the, the river as a center uh, of this future city. It, what actually brings together the different cities that for us make Amsterdam, the different Amsterdams, the historical one uh, on the Amstel with the eccentricity, the one of today, the decadence of the coffee shops of the red light district, but also the one of the golden age, the Amsterdam of commerce, of a uh, huge wealth being accumulated, uh, of a port with all sorts of people and materials flowing. But also the north of the city, which uh, has a memory, a uh, living memory of the industrial past. It has the shipyards, has the working class characters, has the garden cities. And the Amsterdam of the port, with the chimneys and the factories and the heaps of coal and fermenting cereals and the storage facilities and the distribution centers and the smells. So we thought of this as a 
chance to, for Amsterdam to rethink its uh, identity and think of new forms of spaces that could uh, represent and also give dignity to this uh, transformation and to its uh, expanded uh, territory. And today, Six Haven is mostly an unbuilt uh, site. Uh, it has heavily contaminated uh, soils from metals and decades of industry, but, um, and from a developer's perspective for its position, is uh, one of the most valuable properties uh, in Amsterdam. It's at the very center, let's say, at the center of this transformation. So it's this triangular wedge of land, which is a piece of infrastructure, a lock that separates the waters of the eye from those of the North Holland Canal. So as we were asked to think of a public vocation for this place, we start to think of a vocabulary of public spaces for a city, which is made of uh, icons, quite literally, as they kind of grow along the eye of uh, polished uh, boulevards and waterfronts of uh, rather fancy harbors uh, with historical ships on display, and something that we overall thought of as being quite uh, neutral and uh, quite uh, homogeneous and sort of being repeated over and over. And this even within a country in the Netherlands where, which already feels like a, completely like an urbanism uh, manual where everything is uh, pristine and sort of to the book. So with Amsterdam Allegories, we actually wanted to start to think of Six Haven as an experimental uh, public domain on water, which we imagine as a civic port, which is populated then by a collection of floating islands, each expressing and requiring a different kind of engagement uh, and of transformation, which ranges from leisure to production to gardening and uh, relates to the many natures of the city, the different Amsterdams uh, that we wanted to bring to the physical geographical center of the city. We imagined those islands as uh, being only accessible by boat and we started Amsterdam in, on, by boat and on water. And of course in Amsterdam water is also the water of a happy life of going for a I'll say in the evening after work, but for us it's also a very democratic surface. It's in a completely unknown surface for everyone, where there are no traces, there are no beaten paths, where rules come out of uh, circumstances, and they change with the weather, they change with experience. We thought that uh, on water there is, we think on water there is a sense of communion, there's a different way of meeting strangers, a bit like walking on a mountain path and saying hello to each other, making each other known. Um, there is a sentiment of proximity, we think, that comes from being in an environment where we are all foreigners. So we thought of Six Haven as a place for um, discoveries. And uh, uh, the islands uh, translate, translate the suggestions, uh, stories, uh, forms, uh, typologies uh, of Amsterdam expanded territory into a repertoire of architecture uh, and public spaces. Uh. And uh, now we'll tell uh, the stories of them, some of the islands that inhabit this uh, civic port. And uh, this is uh, a house for a collective barbecue, which is made by, collective, uh, uh, by a series of independent fireplaces uh, that build the perimeter of a conical collective space. And uh, it is a place where to rest in a warm room during winter or dry up after a summer storm as the independent rooms on the perimeter that heat the collective uh, circular room. And uh, this is the Fire Island, so it's a black uh, floating mountain. It's a floating embassy of the coal heaps of the port downstream, and uh, is a site for uh, barbecues and uh, adventurous campfires. And uh, this that actually you will see on the screen is the Shore Island, and uh, it is uh, in a way a tribute to the Dutch coast, uh, and it reflects uh, both on coastal erosions, uh, sea, level, sea level rise uh, on, on a country that uh, creates its own land. Uh, but uh, on the other side, it also wants to uh, convey a certain uh, optimism. It is uh, like a vast sandpit from which uh, roofs and chimneys emerge that can be excavated, dug, and buried. And uh, so it's a sand garden that can be farmed collectively. And uh, a sundial that is uh, like celebrating uh, the view on the eye and uh, marking uh, the time on 6-7 with, with its shadows. And a sunken orangerie that floats half submerged and uh, creates with its mass uh, its own microclimate uh, from which maybe uh, you can pick an orange when passing by. And uh, like another island uh, is uh, like a palace of water which is dedicated to swimming on the eye and is a floating memory of the Bell Bathhouse, which was uh, an open-air pool that uh, used to be very close to the site on the north shores of the eye, 
which uh, here becomes a place to swim along, alongside fishes uh, and plants. And uh, this is a, a floating Turkish bath that is uh, heated by the collective effort of seven independent fires. And each stove is used by individuals or groups, and its warmth is regulated by the collective effort. And uh, this is a, uh, a garden for agricultural, uh, spontaneous uh, and ornamental plants uh, and their cultural and botanical intersection. And uh, it's an embassy of the flamboyant Lustov, private pleasure gardens uh, built as places of retreat in the polders around the city um, and uh, were places to go by boat and return by boat. A palace of metals. Uh, the Palace of Metals uh, elevates recycling uh, and upcycling uh, into a civic ritual. A brittle floating square which would slowly decompose and sink in the waters, uh, balancing with its calcium the acidic waters of the eye and uh, slowly consumed over time by weather and use, the surface will event open up to the waters below, becoming a ring, eventually disappearing into the depths of the eye. And uh, then there is a floating aviary uh, to reflect and rethink the cultural categories we use to approach animals, the invasive, the native, the feral. So it's an aviary at the intersection between zoology and politics. And one is a, a nursery for monk parakeets, uh, which are these parrots, these green parrots that uh, yesterday we were also flying in the gardens of the Triennale. And then uh, like there is this uh, like other island that is, we call Civic Forest, uh, and it's a vast table uh, resting on tree stumps uh, where the civic scale emerges in the collective choreography of eating, dancing, playing uh, uh, on a table where a bit like here, uh, every action becomes a performance. And then 300 underground rooms. Uh, uh, protect from the lights of the city and those of the countryside. Uh, and uh, darkness uh, in the Netherlands uh, can only uh, be regained through architecture, can only exist as an interior. A hill of some flowers uh, growing on top of a heap of polluted land. Uh, they absorb uh, lead. Uh, but uh, also in, uh, other, like, other heavy metals. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're here behind this island is that uh, it speaks optimistically about the future, uh, but also gives a warning to those who approach it. Uh, the soil is dangerous, uh, no food may grow here. This was a place of violence. An enfilade of Dutch house profiles is hosting uh, bees, uh, which is a species decreasing in the dense fabric of the city. And uh, it takes the silhouette of the burned Dutch houses uh, as uh, shapes that created the front of the dam square for centuries. And uh, large and small barges uh, filled with materials uh, inhabit 67 for the constant maintenance and the rebuildings of the gardens. And when moored, the barges filled with sand, earth and metals become temporary hilly gardens. Three pastoral islands uh, inhabited by ships, uh, herded by boats uh, from one island to the next uh, as they transform grass grassland into lawns. Uh. And a series of tall perches uh, visible from afar for migratory birds to rest on. Uh. And from a bird's eye perspective, they cast shadows, become a project projected language 
from the ground recompose a skyline, confusing their silhouette with the mass of the docking sailing boats. And uh, through those, uh, we imagine 6 7 as a place of smells, the smells of earth and fermenting cereals that mix with the fumes of the barbecues, uh, while wading birds fish along humans and other animals uh, share the shore with locals and tourists. And the mountains of dark soil create a, a skyline uh, along with a mast of sailing boats and skyscraping perches uh, for migratory birds. And the 6 7 becomes a place to observe and be observed discover and be discovered, transform and be transformed. And uh, like we thought of the islands uh, as places where at the very least different social groups uh, could cross paths, share space, uh, but also as places where Amsterdam citizens meet other species, uh, a place to cultivate a more nuanced relation with nature, uh, a place that offers possibilities of encounter between humans and other animals, plants and minerals, where the citizens could meet embassies of the territory they inhabit, the fluxes of water, the migratory birds, the heaps of materials on the shores. And uh, besides being harbored uh, in 6 7, the islands could move around the city, creating new, unexpected, estranging, or familiar encounters uh, with other figures of the landscape. And uh, with Amsterdam allegories, uh, we wanted to celebrate the messiness of the shore over the sanitized sleekness uh, of the waterfront, uh, the colors uh, of heterogeneity over the grayness of neutrality, the humility of danger uh, over the banality of day-to-day -day survival. And then we mentioned uh, this project is a sort of manifesto for us uh, because we think uh, that there is a chance to reimagine in public space as a place where leisure can become an action, literally recreation, and uh, that can inform new kinds of beauty and discoveries uh, and can enhance encounters uh, between humans and other species uh, and help us reflect on how multicultural cities uh, can produce uh, new and exciting ways of being in a city and of being a citizen, where the citizens will, not, will no longer be seen as uh, users or consumers, but as sailors, gardeners, farmers, collectors, cartographers or explorers. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to Studio Sidiana for a very uh, kind of magical presentation, very, very beautiful imagery and uh, vocabulary and uh, introducing all these ideas of the, the allegories and the uh, multi-species perspectives. I think what a wonderful touch to the morning. Uh, I think we will continue on uh, some of the themes that uh, were mentioned uh, now with Marianne van Albel, uh, who is another designer based in the Netherlands, and also one uh, who has uh, had one of her projects um, uh, collaborating with Het Nieuwe Institute uh, called Power Plant, uh, exploring the idea of um, solar production and solar democracy in, in architecture. Um, and uh, yeah, Marianne uh, practice uh, looks, I think, at the idea of technology and sustainability in, in many different ways. Um, uh, but increasingly also the uh, uh, kind of footprint of architecture, including the fact that she took the train here as opposed to flying, which is very, <laughs> I think, uh, good practice to, to model <laughs> for all of us. Thanks, Marianne. Thank you. First of all, thank you, uh, Joseph, for inviting me here in this amazing building and then along with these super nice practices and also happy to present after Studio Asiriana because a lot of people told me that we should meet and we met yesterday, so that's nice. Um, so my name is uh, Marianne van Abel and I have a studio based in Amsterdam uh, and we are a solar design studio. Um, can you? Oh, yeah, you can see. So I have this like weird obsession with a kind of nerdy thing called solar panels. Um, and I'm going to tell you about this. And I hope in the future we're going to say that a, builder, a building is broken when it doesn't generate its own electricity. We start to say this now, but I think it's an important thing and I want to address this also with you. But first I would like uh, to to tell you why I started this kind of like journey and why, why this obsession for solar panels, how this came about. Because I read this like fact that uh, every hour we receive enough sunlight to provide the world with enough electricity 
for an entire year. And when I was aware of that fact, I realized, okay, I should really focus on just solar panels now because it was an obsession and there's so much work to do. And why are we still looking like down in the ground to oil and gas? Why we should be looking up as there's so much potential coming in all the time? And why do solar panels look like they are, how they are now? So I have a question to you, so Saturday morning. Um, do you have solar panels? And if that's a yes, or do you work with solar panels? Have you ever designed with solar panels? If it's a yes, you stand up. And if you don't, you can stay where you are. Okay, so it's one-fourth, I would say, 25%. Okay, room for improvement here. So solar panels, as how they are now, they're around like 60 years ago. This is a commercial from 1958. Uh, and the first time when they were produced on a, on a quite large, large scale. The first year that the uh, first satellite uh, went into space, the Vanguard. I'm going to give you a bit of solar cell history here. Uh, this is the first telephone call made by solar. So you could say the last 60 years, scientists all over the world have been focusing on making solar panels uh, cheaper. So the price has incre decreased a lot because China started make, uh, producing them on a large scale, but also their efficiency has increased a lot. But if you think about the image of solar panels, that kind of have stayed the same for the last 60 years. It is still this technology that is just like stacked onto something and not integrated into its environment at all. So, like I said, I come from the Netherlands, and this is another example of uh, durable energy. This is uh, a windmill, and in the, the one in the front is something we all know. It's like a couple of hundred years ago, but the ones in the back you see there is like the other modern ones. And a lot of people in the Netherlands are against the sight of these windmills, windmill parks, because they say it's ruined the landscape. But if we look at the ones in the front, I'm wondering what people in the past would think about these like now monuments for, for like, it's like part of our Dutch heritage, you know, we're super proud of these windmills. So I think if we think about renewable energy, something like this needs to change. And I think we can do either two things. We can like really transform them in such a way that they become a monument and really lift them up. And we really think how is their integration or we make them invisible. And if you look at like the history of technology, for example, our handwriting, our clothing, our, the way we cook, it's like all started kind of as a technology, but it's so integrated so we don't perceive it as a technology anymore. So something like that that Elon Musk is doing uh, with his solar tiles, that really thinking about like what is like a clever way of integrating and you don't see it anymore. So these are solar tiles you put on the roof. So, why are we not seeing solar panels everywhere? And what is stopping us? There are a couple of things, I would say. There's one is the industry. Still, still coal factories are being built and they still make a profit. And fortunately, this capitalist system is working like that, so they keep on existing. But I'm positive, so I think things are changing. Like, we're not listening to uh, music on our uh, cassettes or CDs or uh, anymore. We're listening to them on Spotify. So. The, this industry is also changing. Another thing I would say is the sun doesn't always shine. I'm, I lived in the UK and, and uh, the Netherlands, and uh, yeah, there's not a lot of sun there. And it's, so it's not a very reliable source of energy. So you always need to have it together with, uh, together with um, uh, another source of energy. So for example, wind. Another thing is uh, storage. Batteries are still expensive, made of rare materials, um, but also that is slowly changing, luckily. I think we all know that climate change is the biggest problem of our time. And uh, we can't rely on like, the others, the governments, the, the engineers to, to come and to, make, to help us making this, this world change. We all can contribute towards this change. Like I said, I'm a designer. I, I would like to change things through design. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples of my work I've done so far. To really see, this is a table that has integrated solar cells that work indoor. So really see like, that every object is kind of like a living object. So it really produces its own energy. You work from this table, but the table is also giving you this energy. 
uh, thinking about like uh, uh, windows, for example. So here um, you can plug your phone into the window ledges and these current windows, it's like a modern version of stained glass, is giving you this, this electricity. So I'm giving extra functions to objects. A window doesn't have to be just a window, but also as a, as a, form, of, a form of power, power source. Well, so here I am talking about how much I love solar, but I wouldn't stand up because I don't have solar panels on my roof. Um, it's because I live in the center of Amsterdam in the monument, so it's not allowed for me to have, this, uh, have solar panels. So a lot of things from different angles needs to change. And also, I think it's important to see like, how to not make uh, the sustainable lifestyle available for only people that can afford it. Really have to look in different fields and different actions. And uh, luckily, there are a lot of super nice technologies that you can do it with, for example. It's like flexible or transparent or uh, even invisible solar cells you have. So uh, those are ways to look at. And I would say now that if I look around now, I basically see every surface as an opportunity to harvest electricity. Um, and also, I'm starting to look at like how not only use solar panels to generate electricity, but maybe you can also bring it into other fields. For example, the food industry. This is an example of a power plant where the whole, the outside of this greenhouse is uh, giving uh, energy to the inside of the greenhouse. So you can think of placing this onto rooftops and really sort of instead of like uh, taking your food from the other side of the world, growing it locally, uh, so you're saving a lot of food miles and uh, being more sustainable. So it's like the solar panels are kind of like on the sides, so the, the, the light is reflected to the sides and then they uh, make sure they, they power the indoor, indoor climate, so hydroponics, LED lights. So it's a really like the future of farming, you could say. And this was done for the, the de uh, design by Yanel in London last year. Um, so it's super interesting to look at cities now, to see where are the possibilities, where are the surfaces. There are so many surfaces that can be, uh, yeah, can be taken into account. It doesn't have to only be the roofs, but it can be uh, whatever, the curtains, the facades, the streets, everything can, like now with this current technologies, could be harvested electricity. Okay, this was a short, not so short introduction to the project I would like to talk to uh, you, you about. Because, uh, like I said, I don't want to make uh, solar panels just uh, invisible, but also portable and see how big he can go and what are the, the services. So, I was asked by the Dutch uh, government, they, uh, they, they have a sort of program called Young Innovators, and I know Studio Sania did it last year as well for a proposal, and they asked me to do, come up with a proposal for the Dutch Ministry of Finance, and I think they uh, knew I was a solar designer, so I think they also uh, expected to, to look at how it was a kind of a free brief, to see how, uh, how can this building generate its own electricity. To give you a bit of background about this building, it's uh, the Minis Dutch Ministry of Finance in The Hague. So it's this building, it's pretty big. Um, and a bit of history, it's uh, like an old brutalist building, built in the 70s. And because it's like a, as I think it was a beautiful building, but it was made of a lot of concrete, it was like at a heart of a lot of harsh lines and stuff. So people found it too harsh and too like, too much finance, I would say, in the, in the architecture. So in 2008, they had a renovation. They made it more friendly. It has a climate tower, and um, they put like a glass yeah, facade over it. So you see the old uh, building and sort of the new friendly one. It's very open and transparent, and they made the courtyards open into sort of public spaces. I found some, I went in the archives of the New Institute, found some nice old, uh, images of it, so you really see these like strong lines of the old building, which I, and great uh, interiors, which I really loved. So, it's a massive building, the, it's like 6,000 uh, 6, uh, square meters, and I just saw a lot of potential. It's like, I would, would like to see it as like sort of a powerhouse, so how, what kind of surfaces can we cover with this? So I started looking at three of the things, so that's energy, uh, circularity, and uh, design. So those were the three points 
we looked at when designing this building. So first one uh, I would like to use for this building is uh, our organic solar panels. I brought some samples. So these are flexible uh, ones made out of uh, polymer, so you can also recycle them. And they work in kind of diffuse lights indoors, but of course better outdoors. And another one is uh, our solar cells that have a ceramic print, print on them. It's like a translucent print, so it doesn't affect the uh, efficiency too much. Of course, a couple of percent, that's yeah, what it is, but uh, still you can make any surface how you want it to look like. Um, and we've been looking at heliotrophy, because the building was placed not on the south, but it was southwest, so it never had real sun all the time. And this is what uh, sunflowers, for example, do. They move along with the sun. So they constantly were like taking most advantage of the sunlight. So this is how we designed this building too. So constantly, all the panels on the facade, they were following kind of this, the sun, so they would like move on. I gave this presentation last week only, so the models are quite fresh. Um, we looked at the potential, what are the, how much energy you can harvest from it, what are the good areas, made uh, light simulations, and we decided to focus on three points. So the uh, facades and glass, the roof, and the atrium. Starting with the uh, facade, so this has in front of the concrete, because we wanted to keep some elements of the old building, uh, has these, these moving sort of, yeah, uh, things that are sort of following the light. And we looked at patterns that are kind of like based on nature that wouldn't be too busy, but altogether would sort of for form a sort of like skin or a sort of thing over the whole building, sort of little hairs that are following the light. So very simple pattern, but together make this kind of like natural pattern. Then we focus on uh, also the glass, because um, I'm part of the Dutch pavilion for the World Expo in Dubai this year. And there, we also had to think about how can you make a uh, sort of um, exhibition like that circular, because it's just a six months uh, exhibition, it's, uh, it's in the middle of the desert, you bring, ship all these things in, but how can we uh, source local materials and then ship it back and give it another purpose? So I developed kind of like solar stickers you can put onto the glass, and then later you can just like take them out and replace them. So the tower will have similar uh, stickers, as when you're inside, you kind of like have this kind of church idea with, with light and where the colors are coming in. The roof, I don't need to talk too much about it because it is like, okay, it's a lot of surface, so it has a lot of solar panels, but I thought it would be nice because it's going to be, if it's going to be built, I'm not sure how much of the proposal they will take, but they were super positive about it. But if you have a flying car, you go over it, you know, you see also something else than just solar panels, or you go on Google Maps, this also tells a nice story as well. And then the atrium. I have a model, a small model up there. Um, this also has this kind of like moving heliotropy solar panels that move again together with the sun. So the, constant, the, the insulation is constantly changing depending on the time of the day. So this is like 9 o'clock, then you go to 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and then in the evening it's kind of powering itself because it's like a nice LED strip. So you see it's kind of like where the energy is going to. Well, how much energy is produced? This is quite a lot, 3 gigawatts hours per year. Uh, that's really a lot, but when I heard about what the energy consumption of that building is, it would be like completely neutral and it would co uh, completely power itself. It would be if it would be a normal office building, but as it is the Dutch Ministry of Finance, they have a big data center in the in the backyard of in the in the basement, so that's not really fair because that takes like 70% of the normal energy consumption like is going to that. So you should have like a windmill next to that building basically, but. Yeah, so it was like now it was 65%, but if it would be a normal office building, it would be super 100% and had lots of leftovers. So to come back again to this thing, so this is like the, we kept the elements of the sort of the old structure, really like left it transparent, which was like done by the, uh, re uh, in 2008, where they did the renovation. And as I said, I like the old brutalist building a lot, so in the evening, you kind of like see, with LED lights, you kind of like see the skeleton of the old 
building you can, you can see back. So this was like one of the, the this is like quite a, like I said, I'm not an architect, but it was super nice for me to work on a big project like this. This was when I came in this building, oh, you can like design this building. It was a bit too much for me, but we started making models and make it smaller, look at the elements and it became super interested. And yeah, we, we worked on this for the last six months. <clears throat> and now we're gonna yeah, make a pilot and make this like really happen. This is super cool. So uh, you mentioned it already, Tamar. Like I believe in a solar democracy. That's really like see like how can you see solar everywhere and for everyone? How can we do this? How is it gonna look like? What do we need to do for this? Not only like talking about design, but really bring all everyone together and uh, yeah, basically see every surface as an opportunity, basically. So thank you. That was it. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, now we go to the next uh, studio, uh, which is called Cosmos Architects, um, an office uh, collaborating virtually, bringing together partners based in Zurich, Moscow, Graz, and New York. Um, uh, Cosmos uh, is working on many different kind of formats of projects, I think from uh, airports and master plans to uh, Christmas gifts, <laughs> um, and also uh, educational programs, uh, details, different kind of research into architectural elements. and. Um, yeah, a very expensive practice. So very interested to hear what you'll talk about. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, we are very happy to be here, and we're very grateful to Josep, to Laura, to Trinali for invitation. Um, we will show today a book. Um, it's very much work in progress um, because we thought that probably this book is about our passion and inspiration which we were driven probably from the very beginning of our practice. It's about temporary structures and um, we thought that it's interesting to present it as a work in progress uh, and treat this event more as a workshop, as a brainstorm rather than um, rather than like presentation of the final product. So we would be very grateful if uh, all of you would give some feedback, comment, uh, discuss it, and uh, afterwards, after this event, we think to uh, finalize it. And uh, we will, s does it work now? Yeah. yeah, so we'll start from the short introduction uh, of our office. And yes, please collect some books while we're showing because apparently the screen is not so visible while we're sitting over there. It was almost impossible to see uh, any images and it's in many, like it's all about images. Okay, okay. Uh, finally, um, it's working. So yes, hello, we would like to, um, to give first a couple of words. Why, why did this topic uh, become so important for us that we decided to make a little publication and uh, we are Cosmos, as was uh, told, uh, we are practicing from different uh, cities and um, this book, which we call Contemporary, uh, Temporary Texture, which we will explain a bit later, but it comes to the materials which we used in the buildings and uh, we were always uh, inspired and used some materials which were uh, temporary and uh, had some uh, interesting ideas in them. For instance, we used debris netting in the construction of the summer museum for garage pavilion we, yes, we used the, the, we referenced a lot the billboard for our uh, project uh, for a sports center in Moscow, uh, which was basically a, for a three-dimensional uh, billboard structure which could, could be occupied by users. We used also the uh, insulation foil, which is usually uh, not uh, revealed in architecture in order to clad the, the facades of an old factory in Moscow. Um, we used the, the reference of Bauprofilia, a Swiss device for democratic uh, buildings in our project for uh, Prague Quadrinalia, a uh, competition we won um, for a Swiss pavilion. 
and uh, we used also the reference of the diverse materials which protect users and protect buildings in our installation in Swiss Art Awards. And now we would like to go basically to the to the project. Uh, we'll probably start from. I mean, we start the, uh, our book with a, a series of posters, and these posters we um, uh, decided to use double meaning to reflect duality of the structures uh, in the city. Like sometimes look radical, but uh, apparently it doesn't manifest anything. It's maximum effect, but with the minimum means. Um, it looks temporary, but uh, in a way it's timeless. Uh, it's scaleless, but built on human scale. Uh, it's decorative, but actually it's very functional. Uh, it's modest, but at the same time flamboyant. Uh, looks like wasteful, but it's all because of the ecological reasons. Uh, fake, but this like fakeness somehow surrounds us and becomes real. Um, sometimes it looks primitive and very basic, but actually it's futuristic and precedes the future. Uh, it looks global, but through these structures we also can find some vernacularity of nowadays. Uh, aggressive or just dutiful, mm, either like random, but all based on very practical logic. Uh, dump, but also very efficient. Um, trashy, but it's kind of aesthetical. Um, or ordinary, but at the same time, this ordinarity uh, makes it very unique. And especially here in Milano, if someone didn't recognize. Um, and alien sometimes, but at the same time natural, or let's say second natural. Um, Wait, Leonid, you have a support. Because uh, people believe it's temporary, so basically they kind of ignore it and they really switch off this layer. So this stood for 10 years, a wall of almost 800 meters long, 15 meters high, and uh, it was completely, uh, let's say, not noticed by the people. So although massive, it's quite invisible. Excessive or urgent, just because um, it's needed, or it looks false, but at the same time very imaginary, either obsolete, but also contextual. Yeah, and now we come to the reason why we called basically our book uh, Temporary Texture and uh, why we did such a, such a big, uh, basically, blow up of a pocketbook. So the, the, the thing is that how we were taught architecture on this, uh, on this picture, uh, which is an um, ideal city by uh, Piero della Francesca, it shows how at least we were taught to design architecture proportions, uh, spaces, uh, architectural colors, and so on. But actually, if you look at any real city nowadays, it's all uh, covered by this, this uh, basically utilitarian infrastructure, temporary, which, uh, as we discussed, as we found out, people don't really uh, notice because they kind of exclude that uh, from their perception because it's not considered design architecture. So, and uh, when we were also studying, I remember one of the first books I had was this huge Phaidon atlas of star architects, Frank Gehry Morphosis, which was in all architectural offices, and we thought of uh, basically making a kind of a manifesto for this architecture, which has no actually author. Usually it's anonymous, usually it's utilitarian, and we basically crossed out the, the word con from contemporary and archi, being uh, archi in Greek means chief and main. And basically, if you cross it out, you just stay with texture. So texture which is Which means structure. Yes, which means structure. And texture is this, um, the word which we use to describe the structures. Um, just some things which we think is especially interesting in, in, uh, in temporary structures, like for example, texture is urgent. And uh, it never appears for fun or represents some political goals. It just solves the problem, which is exists right now, and as soon as this problem is solved and gone, uh, it's get disassembled and reused somewhere else. And texture is minimal, since again, uh, there's no standards of beauty applied on these uh, structures. It just solves any problem with the minimal uh, material, as efficient as possible. Uh, texture is contemporary. Uh, it appears tomorrow or today when needed. Uh, well, normal building usually takes, depending on the country and the circumstance, but about seven years. And if we just think that we try to solve the problem 
of the site seven years ago, for the people who lived there seven years ago, uh, the problem which exists there seven years ago with the technologies of seven years ago, it's kind of very outdated to call it contemporary. In these terms, Tekshi is really, um, it's really uh, contemporary. The other thing is also interesting, uh, Tekshi is free. Architecture is uh, imprisoned by law, by regulations, by uh, city regulations, by regulations of uh, monument preservation and so, and then in the end only very limited envelope left with a lot of uh, already pre-described guidelines how architecture should develop and um, uh, it limits in many ways architecture. Uh, well, texture usually is free out of all these restrictions and then can propose something really innovative and really interesting to look at. Uh, and texture is fair. Uh, architecture is very conservative in terms of meaning of beauty. Uh, we set certain standards how buildings are supposed to look like and despite technologies made a significant progress, we still, we still pretend that it made by technologies of, I don't know, 100 years ago. We clad buildings by artificial stone precast panels pretending it is just solid uh, stone blocks. Uh, well, normal wall nowadays consists of seven, ten layers, and we kind of um, ashamed to show it. Well, texture has no any decoration. Each element is very functional, practical, and reveals its actual uh, role in the structure. It's also because of the same things which we, uh, which we found out when we looked at texture, we realized it's quite free from the client, from the political, from the uh, taste of people, from the uh, contemporary, let's say, uh, movements, styles, and uh, stylistic desires, de decoration, and so on. And basically, we, uh, have, uh, we have subdivided our book. We have uh, looked at what things uh, does texture deal with. And we have subdivided into seven chapters, which are here. It's construction, fake, climate, safety, event, war, and vernacular, and now we will just basically th flip through the book very quickly, and um, basically, obviously, that construction is uh, one of the uh, main things why texture uh, exists, but it also shows the way how economic works uh, in the cities when you basically see, um, and, and sometimes it's much more unique. So, for instance, here we can see the Taipei Performance Center by OMA, and you can see these platonic shapes, like very modernist, very show off, but in the end, the texture above it is just a, a kind of a cute vernacular, very simple roof to, to take the water away. And, um, and, and um, basically here, um, you can see how texture is also um, uh, exists in the historical monuments building, so basically in in, in our um, collective imagination, there is these beautiful postcard images of Big Ben, of San Marco, but when you travel, you obviously know that they don't look uh, like this all the time, and uh, uh, actually, it sometimes much more unique and much more technological than... Yeah, and the uh, interesting thing, every time when we see construction in historical monuments, uh, we see big disappointments uh, on visitors' faces. But exactly this state uh, of the building, when it's cladded by uh, scaffolding, makes it unique makes your visit unique. Yeah, or here, for instance, this is a military arch in the center of Moscow, and here it's quite, uh, I don't know, uh, for me it's quite a unique picture. It looks almost like uh, Alexander Brodsky installation, but it was actually just a, um, just a temporary structure. Or here, when it's completely blocked and deprived from its military and political and aggressive uh, kind of uh, thing, and it's just a, a neutral black cube in the city. Or here, when the quite ugly postmodern uh, like gazebo was covered in a very thin film and uh, it creates immediately a functional pavilion. Or this building which was just a generic building but became a very radical thing which is again completely, um, let's say it's invisible for like people, like for preservationists, for people who uh, are against, let's say, radical and uh, strong architecture in the center of the city. Here you can see it uh, uh, exactly in the, the heart of Moscow. And also what we have noticed that uh, this is some historical pic pictures of the uh, construction sites of uh, famous churches, Rome obelisks, uh, cathedrals and so on, and we can see that actually uh, the cathedral which comes out from the, from the construction on the 
uh, 18th century is uh, quite a classical and uh, traditional building, but the, um, the, the, the scaffolding which surrounds it looks much more than uh, like a no contemporary building. Uh, so in a way, the, the aesthetics and the, the reasoning of this structure preceded uh, the, its own architecture for 200 years without actually no one realizing and um, calling it. It's probably the, the problem they tried to solve by erecting a 40 tons uh, monument or column uh, by that time was really a superhuman task, and for that they need superhuman structure. The other condition is fake, and uh, it's interesting that uh, when we call fake, we're speaking about these printed facades which um, covering construction sites or just uh, filling the gaps in the city fabric. Uh, and even though it has uh, quite a bad connotation, like a fake, false architecture, but apparently, is it a death or future of architecture? Uh, if in contemporary society, when we rebuilding uh, buildings every 20 years or renovating them every 20 years, should we waste actually real material uh, for facades of these buildings when just print can make its job and uh, deliver information about structure, facade, design, material, uh, if we need function? Do we need to detach completely facade from its inner uh, from the inner structure of the city, how much information should we provide, and how minimal and ecological in these terms should we be? Should we really saw a rock in Alps to clad building with granite when we can just print this granite? And of course, this happens uh, already because most of the structures which you see on the screen and in the picture, they exist already. There's there are sometimes for 10 years uh, this uh, plastic film is there for 10 years, and people just. Uh, don't don't consider it. And behind the life goes. There is concrete slabs, uh, building functions, but it's considered bad taste. It's considered fake. And we're not saying that this is the only way to go. But at least that's a point for a, a reflection for us. And also, a texture actually helps us uh, to so, to deal with ecological issues. And uh, one of the the key examples is, for instance, uh, Swiss glaciers which melt and uh, which are uh, co covered right now with. Um, with different fabrics, with different techniques in order to prevent the, uh, the melting of the glaciers. And um, funny enough, uh, in Switzerland and Rhone Glacier, they have uh, continued the operational... So basically, there's a tourist uh, place where tourists like to go. It's a cave. And instead of stopping tourism, they just covered it with blankets in order to keep it not melting so more tourists can come and more tourists can enjoy. And uh, when we uh, teach the taught in Bangkok, we have uh, noticed another typology of these uh, parking lots, which were covered also with debris netting, which were providing a very beautiful uh, atmosphere, but also it was providing um, climate comfort for the people. And this one in, and obviously uh, Italian examples of the Venice flooding, when the whole city becomes like an elevated path walks. Uh, and uh, they're always already there, and uh, basically uh, it shows how texture is really urgent, immediate, and uh, solves uh, without actually any design or like any creative design of an architect without his ego. It just solves the the issues, and um, basically plastic uh, uh, or like PVC nets which cover the landscape. They also look unecological. Obviously, they they look uh, kind of bad bad to nature, but in 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 reality they help the nature to generate more plants and so on, and uh, they help it to, uh, to, to produce more. So basically, funny enough, it's, um, it, it's uh, really working in the opposite way, how it looks. And we continue with the sandbags, which also help for flooding. And, um, uh, and the, next, uh, the next chapter, which we realized was uh, how it works is with safety and um, safety is very interesting because we all know safety, safety first, and uh, this like simple saying shows the role of safety in any building design. Uh, it could be very ugly, uh, annoying, disturbing. It's usually applied on top of architectural design. Often architects uh, play that it doesn't exist, uh, but it's unavoidable. It will be in the building because it's must to be. But at the same time, these regulations are so strong and so important. Then uh, elements of safety creates uh, like fantastic, radical, and ex extremely inspiring sometimes patterns. Sometimes they're funny or charming. Uh, sometimes they're ridiculous. Like, for example, here, the screen on the uh, right, uh, it's a screen which they hang in when they're uh, tearing down the building so the dust uh, wouldn't go so 
uh, wouldn't wouldn't go uh, so much out of the side. Sometimes it's really funny. Like for example, these um, brooms uh, in Switzerland, they should uh, alarm train, uh, train operator about any elements who could stick out from temporary structures. Uh, sometimes a very uh, very monumental, sometimes they, again, just like uh, funny and confusing. Uh, at the same time, they, it's invisible, and uh, it's also helped us to test city fabric. Like, for example, this wall, uh, it was um, um, it was surrounding uh, Zaryadia Park, probably some of you heard about it. It's right in front of Kremlin in Moscow. It, this wall is uh, was 760 meters long and 15 meters high, which exists there for 10 years. And uh, no one even complained. It was like absolutely invisible since it's, it's safety, temporary. Uh, but it also created a lot of identity in the city. And uh, a lot of uh, like actual, fun it provides a lot of functionality to the city. And, and here we can see that the pattern, the, there is some kind of decorative pattern, which uh, basically not designed by architect, but like yellow means sometimes either it's alarming or it has to do with the covering of the material in order to not be combustible. So there is a, quite a flamboyant set color, but it was really not designed uh, in order to, to be aesthetical or beautiful. And that's interesting as well. Like, well, architects often complain about safety regulations. If safety would be taken into account in the design brief from the very beginning, uh, with the same importance as uh, spatial drama and uh, I don't know, combination of the materials, uh, the design could be much more innovative, brave, and, um, and uh, provocative or radical. And the, the next condition which we want to speak is uh, event. You stay there. Ah, um, Okay, so Leon, will, uh, we, we're supposed to speak one condition. Uh, but, yeah, but since, uh, we, since the voice is, <laughs> since the switch is so annoying. So anyway, uh, uh, the other one is events, and it's interesting how uh, events, uh, event structures, they uh, separating, uh, f like they kind of ruining uh, the triad of Vitruvius when each element should be functional, decorative, uh, and uh, structurally, and work structurally. Here we see that elements almost detach from each other. There is a function, there is a structure, and sometimes it's uh, wrapped by beauty. Uh, so in these terms, it's interesting to see how um, efficient they are and how, in these terms, uh, innovative uh, they are. And here, for example, it's a very interesting event. Uh, it takes place every 10 years, and it's the biggest gathering in India, and uh, it brings together, uh, I think, 100 million people uh, every 12 years. So these bridges erected uh, only to provide, uh, uh, to help these people to cross the river. And the, the next and uh, the second to last uh, condition is war, which we describe as basically the real architecture is uh, being very precious very important in the city during the the real crisis which is a, a war obviously it's uh, it's very hard to to mask it and basically different techniques were used for instance this is during the second world war moscow and st petersburg it's a kind of self-protecting mode which architecture applies on itself and it's interesting how also uh, like what, what you see now on the screen it's manege it's one of the uh, biggest building in the center of moscow and during the second world war uh, it was this, uh, the task was to uh, Put a um, pattern which would um, confuse uh, the pilots who are going to bomb so they wouldn't recognize the important building and they would think it's just like um, uh, many small uh, structures. Like here, for example, it's Bolshoi Theater. Uh, it's the main theater of uh, Russia, which also turned to be just a combination of small volumes. Uh, there was also drawn uh, cities uh, like here's Manej Square, it's right next to Kremlin, and then on this square, so it wouldn't be recognized uh, from uh, from high up, uh, they drew some fake roofs, uh, which were supposed to as well consume, uh, confuse uh, pilots, and that was the way they protect monuments. And here, like one um, American example, there's a fake city next to a Boeing factory, which is also supposed to uh, confuse um, uh, pilots who, in order they want to bomb. And more contemporary and more, let's say, European examples is recently during the protest of Gilets jaunes, uh, basically all the, uh, all the luxury shops, uh, boutiques and, make, uh, and uh, cafes, they were uh, boarded up and we asked one uh, French photographer to share with us his 
uh, photographs when uh, basically this this is a new layer created in the city and uh, it's really basically symbolic but it's also very interesting how these kind of powerful uh, rich shops are covered with these completely neutral and blank things and, and then and, get disassembled and basically here we come to the to the last uh, chapter in uh, to the um, to the last chapter in our book which is basically we realize that texture is uh, in our uh, in the world where basically architects build all, all around the world and the uh, contemporary like uh, modern skyscraper can, can global trends in architecture uh, to complete like architectural design and the same architect design in Hong Kong, Moscow, New York and uh, London and there's no actually vernacularity in that because we use the same materials, the same companies, the same uh, technological achievements. Texture in very low tech, uh, but they seem to be very technological, remain vernacularity. It shows the uh, local materials, for example, like this bamboo scaffolding. Uh, it also has to do with the fact that texture is economical. No one is really thinking how to make the most beautiful texture, like Zaha Hadid wants it, but they think where to get it quick, uh, how to reuse it, how to send it back, how to, to make the least, uh, how no to, one would to spend ever the less. Ship. The least. Scaffolding uh, 2,000 kilometers to another country, they yeah. just take the scaffolding they have here. Yeah, or this another example which we have already touched is this uh, basically uh, called the Bau Profil. It's a, a very symbolical Swiss thing which announces the future of construction when people can vote for these future buildings and uh, basically they, they create for you a vision of a future building without actually building it and then they can be reassembled and brought back. Or this uh, typical in cold climates such as like Mosk uh, Russia or Canada, uh, the heated up construction sites which look like, especially at night, they look very beautiful when they glow and there is inside the uh, hot air so that the construction and the, especially the concrete processes can happen during the, the cold period. And now to... I want to finalize uh, the book yes. by a very uh, kind of summary of what we learned. Uh, it's kind of it's kind of manifested, but it has no order to manifest that. So this is some of the things which we try to learn for contemporary architecture from temporary structures, and we call it new order. And as you can see in this uh, photo, this combination of classical architecture and uh, temporary architecture. Basically, uh, it's not a collage; it's a colosseum on the re reconstruction. So um, here is the most, uh, let's say, uh, obvious example of what we're describing. Uh, and um, um, we afterwards thought, uh, after analyzing uh, all, all the things which we've seen and they showed in this book, we tried to, uh, we thought probably doesn't, like Vitruvius triad of architecture, function, structure, and beauty, probably not so much applied uh, after 2000 years uh, in all the climates around the world after crazy technological progress. And we tried to look at this very technological, contemporary, anonymous structures um, understand what would be the new triada uh, or what would be triad of uh, texture. And these terms we call it urgent, efficient and fair. And urgent, uh, that means architects actually should try not to build. Uh, in the world which overbuilt and overpopulated with buildings, uh, we have to more think about how to manage more uh, functions in one building, like typical office building which works, uh, let's say, eight, day, uh, eight hours a day, uh, would in the end give us uh, 48 hours a week of working time, while the week is 160 hours. Uh, that means that 25% of the, uh, the building is efficient and the rest of the time is just not used. So we have to learn how to pack more uh, in the, more process in the same building and make it work really 24 hours, seven days a week. And architects in these terms should probably shift from chief builder to chief curator of the space. The other one is uh, efficient, like maximum effect with minimum means. We every time have to, uh, it's interesting to see uh, how texture achieve maximum with minimum and uh, reuse and flexibility. All these elements of temporary structures reused in different construction sites. And as we said, never shipped uh, around. And the last one was fair, which we, we said naked purpose, that means it fairly shows every, every element, reveals the role of each element in the structure and colors and details. It's a way of communication. Uh, it's not just abstract pattern, but uh, each color has its own meaning, like uh, it's applied over there when you have to emphasize something or guide a visitor through. And then in the end, this language uh, has a lot of potential. And when you just communicate what building is supposed to communicate uh, with this language, it's already en explicit enough and does need additional beautification. 
And in the end, we finish it with um, looking again at texture that uh, texture that doesn't invent any beauty, it just declares as it is, and it declares the beauty. And in these terms, uh, all the innovation of uh, texture and all the aesthetical innovation is uh, typological innovation. So probably we also have to more think not to how to create new aesthetics, but more how to create new typology of the structure, which then would require new technology, and then this technology would bring us a new beauty and new aesthetics. Um, thank you, and we're open. Obviously, this is a manifesto, this is a super kind of uh, practical manifesto of this type of architecture. It doesn't mean that uh, we are now practice are completely following these rules. It's more to, to present you this book, and, uh, and basically that's also uh, why we blew it up uh, like 10 times in order to show its kind of boldness and uh, uh, printed it on the same uh, material which these huge fake facades are done. Thank you very much and uh, we would be happy to discuss with you and uh, Now, the, later, the break. formally or informally. Thank you. Um, for our next group, uh, we changed the, the schedule, sorry. So actually we will have a presentation from DOMA. Oh, no, no, you are the center for speech. <laughs> you oh, represented yeah. here twice. Okay. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, well, uh, actually, uh, they're together in alphabetical order, so a very nice pairing there. Um, uh, so, Maxime uh, Rokmaniko is also representing Center for Spatial Technologies, um, a group of architects, researchers, and educators who develop solutions for spatial problems, hacking economic, technological, and political infrastructures to shape the future city. Very nice. Thank you. What is up? Uh, yeah, before, when my presentation is loading, I just want to say, again, this is, has been really nice. I, I would totally come here just as a guest to see all of the projects. It, I mean, uh, it's been an enormous pleasure also to meet uh, a lot of you. Um, all right, it's working. So um, I'm, I'm here also presenting the young practice. We exist for two years. It's called the Center for Special Technologies. We are a group of kind of architects and designers, as Tamar uh, presented us. But I guess um, what distinguishes us uh, is that we kind of are, we have this kind of hacker culture. We just like play with things. We try to not take one client, one project commissions. We try to work on things that are systematic. And um, from that, I will kind of show you a project that is uh, kind of um, similarly to Cosmos's one is a kind of exploration which was done kind of, um, again, to kind of uh, provoke you guys a bit and try to, try to think together with you about certain things that we felt for a long time that we wanted to explore. So kind of using this as a chance to um, speak about these things. So uh, we are based in uh, Kiev. Uh, and um, yeah, th which also brings uh, a lot of interesting uh, kind of specificity to what we do. Um, we were told to show just one project, so I won't go too far in terms of what kinds of different things we do. But the, what we're going to show here somehow uh, echoes the project that we've done with the London-based practice Dark Matter Labs. And it's been basically a report for a company that is funded by Mayor of London that basically was looking at new tools for architects and new tools for design. And we were basically exploring whatever, BIMs, um, in, Internet of Things, all of the kind of uh, fancy computer looking things that exist out there. And like, I mean, again, like I did this screenshots yesterday and if you just Google like building information modeling or like digital twin, you get this kind of blue, dark blue slides with like white lines and it's, it's awesome. It's made for dudes. Uh, it kind of looks, um, looks like something that you want to probably play with, do you? Um, I mean, th this is the person who's uh, like really, really important for me. I mean, most of things that I do is because of uh, me reading her books. Um, she has this amazing article which is called uh, Internet of Things. And uh, basically, in that article, she references Latour who says, speaking about this kind of uh, alternative CAD, which is um, kind of unlike the CAD we have, which basically describes objects in a world that just are, you know, like basically referenced, it would somehow actually show what those objects do and kind of try to reference these um, kind of web of uh, cultural, political, and economic forces that 
those objects are somehow connected to. So um, this combined together with this kind of idea of deep addressability, which uh, we borrow from Benjamin Bratton, um, is somehow also uh, the foundation for what I'm going to show. So here you basically see the sort of um, IPv6 address, which is, uh, I mean, just a way to uh, to reference something on the internet, uh, being printed on a like a micro micro scale. So I think it's like at the scale of a cell or something. But the point is that what Benjamin is talking here about is that uh, like it would be interesting if we develop this kind of uh, deep addressability in the world in which we wouldn't only be able to reference each specific object, like me or the mic, but also would be able to reference all the relationships between objects, for example, me speaking uh, to this mic. So um, this kind of idea of like Internet of Things being something that models the relationships in the space is something we also save, and uh, we talk about this a bit later. Uh, I mean, the, just an example, this is a project called by Terra Zero, which uh, basically is uh, about assigning a cryptocurrency wallet to plants, and um, they made this installation where there's a camera that looks at plants, plants grow with certain speed, and uh, people can buy and sell plants, which basically is combining this kind of Ethereum hash and the object and the camera that can see how quickly the object grows. And therefore, we have an example here where there's a real world thingy, the little plant, and by adding these kind of, um, uh, how you say it, like properties to the object, we can basically uh, figure out some sort of different relationship between things. We can, like, in this case, let people speculate and buy and sell plants and regret that they bought the plant that doesn't grow so fast or regret that they bought the plant when it was so, like, uh, so nice, but then it stopped growing. Uh, in any case, uh, Networked Homes is the proposal that we brought here for you. Um, it's basically this kind of uh, attempt to marry our interest into like critical as exploration of um, actor network theory, like um, in, uh, this kinds of things about Internet of Things, and these tools that we constantly study, and also like uh, Mikola, who's here with me, he's uh, basically a BIM uh, manager, so so we have like a expertise in the office which has to do with like actually providing services of uh, like setting up software for larger architecture offices or big um, development companies to kind of develop tools for them. And again, like uh, this is the nature of, uh, of this proposal, which also we plan to continue working on for quite a long time in terms of um, the fact that our interest is basically to develop tools. It's to develop things that don't exist yet, they should exist. We know that those kind of um, like Autodesk stack or different kinds of softwares that we all use, they, they have a very specific set of inten uh, incentives of what kinds of things they model. We all know these kinds of um, uh, increase profits, reduce risks kinds of uh, forces that like are, are pretty much everywhere. But um, what we're more or less asking is if, if buildings are these kinds of socio-material networks that come together in certain moment in time and space, uh, why don't we use those tools to actually try to model them as profoundly as we can and to kind of try to trace relationships between things that are actually mattering? And mattering here is kind of a fan funny word. Uh, but in any case, um, yeah, I'm going to show you uh, what we actually do. So DOMA, yes, we presented DOMA yesterday. Uh, for this project, we have an apartment that we are playing with as a sort of test case. And as soon as we got that test case, and we have different dwellers within this apartment, we got a question. What is a fair way for the people who use this apartment to uh, pay for it, right? So if there's two dwellers, they have different, um, kind of, they use different amounts of square meters, they use electricity in different ways. What are fa fair ways to uh, split the bill? So this is a very practical question, but then out of this question, we also kind of started to look at things like, um, Again, smart contracts and ways to figure this out. But in any case, I'm going to show you the apartment. It's pretty nice. We did um, 3D scans of it uh, three times. First time when we just purchased it. So it was a nice Stalinist building with uh, floors that are made of wood, which were very nice. And uh, 
Yeah, we made a mess. Um, we kind of uh, decided that we need to reshape it a bit. We saved a lot of things, though. Uh, so the floor is still there. Uh, if you see our little uh, presentation on the table, it kind of does this thing. It looks as these three moments in time. And it basically tries to like show you the collage of these different moments. And again, I'm going to go back to this. So um, again, uh, we have this kind of meta project, which has to do with the finding these different relationships. But I, I also think like this is something that would be interesting to talk to uh, most of you here, is kind of, um, I guess, this question of how to run a practice and how do we get to work, how do we get commissions that are kind of uh, paid in a way that we can develop uh, new things. So uh, for us, uh, we basically have this uh, meta story about like uh, things that talk to each other and um, relationships within it. But we also know that there's this massive, massive problem of uh, carbon, kind of um, all of the materials that we had to buy for renovating an apartment are uh, have, have embodied carbon, which is the carbon that is needed to produce them. We decided to focus on this aspect here. And uh, we also know that this is like a project that uh, needs to exist out there. And we kind of have intuitive feeling that we, um, we know how to get funding to build it further. So uh, right here you see the sort of um, a prototype of a computational system that references different objects in the apartment. And you have cards, which are basically the sort of proto-computational systems uh, thingies, which um, you can also play with and kind of see how, how they relate to different uh, things on the floor plan. Um, yeah. So basically what we did first is we collect all the checks. Uh, the sort of um, every, every single thing we paid for, we scanned and we also digitized, which um, I have to say, it wasn't too much fun. Uh, it's a huge Excel sheet. Um, we also assigned the uh, unit classes to each object. So there's this kind of uh, thing called unit class, which lets you reference specifically each single uh, material or product or uh, work that is being done inside of the thing. And then, because we have amazing Kolya, we've built this um, kind of object oriented. Um, uh, a structure that basically hosts all the um, uh, all the data about each object. So it's basically it references Revit model and it has like an ID for each thing and it has an address. Who remembers I was talking about addresses and addressability? Here are addresses. It's right here. Uh, and we can like we can also assign. Uh, remember that little plant that has a wallet. Uh, we can like assign whatever we want to this plant or whatever we want to this particular element, which in this case is a concrete thing in a slab. Um, and we can actually make these things talk to each other, which is really interesting and exciting, and we look forward to explore what is possible out of this. So we use BHOM, which is this kind of technical thing, which um, is an open source way to reference things. Then we connect them via Speckle, which is this kind of another piece of tech, which is also open source that also brings things from one software package to another so we're not stuck inside of like a Autodesk stack. So we have like a Revit model, which basically is being kind of digested into pure data and being reassembled in Rhino. Um, and, and this is uh, the beginning of conversation about things we want to explore, the stories that matter. So uh, for example, uh, materials and supply chains. We, exactly as I said, we know that those things are really important. and. Uh, like even uh, like putting GPS trackers on like waste and seeing where it goes and kind of trying to understand what that goes. So j just a, um, quick, a little uh, mark here. The renovation process, we don't see it as a design, as a specifically kind of fancy design project. We kind of assume that it's a normal thing that everyone does in Kiev where this project was done. Therefore, the kind of forensic analysis of things that happened to this apartment, we can kind of extrapolate to the larger image and understand, OK, if we do the waste management this way, it's probably how other people do it. If we use these materials, it's not because like we didn't do anything specifically like environmentally minded. We just kind of looked at the, the normal way that 
construction people did this and trying to analyze this and then think about what is possible to do. So this is uh, Provenance, which is a um, company that does these things for food. It basically lets you trace where each, each um, food product comes from and what kinds of um, qualities it has and what kind of labor is used for its production. So we kind of um, think about this, that this would be nice to have in a building kind of construction industry. Uh, this is the, the thing that we're using currently to uh, model the embodied carbon. So it's called EC3. It literally came out this um, December, I think, or an end of November. So we were like, as soon we, as we, talk, we were talking to Laura, we were like, oh, what should we do? And we found this. We thought, okay, let's just like uh, calculate, calculate embodied carbon. And out of this, we already kind of um, have a longer term project, which has to do with um, actually really focusing on that as a set of relationships and thinking together with our colleagues and friends about what kinds of, um, what kinds of things are possible to do with that. So again, here you have this kind of uh, cards, which are basically a prompt for you guys to play with this thing and see, okay, there's a bedroom floor. There is this kind of little JSON file, which is the, a piece of code. It's basically a table that is hierarchical. It just says that, uh, this piece of floor or this wall uh, was done by this guy, was done with these materials, and these materials were bought here and blah, blah, blah. So, so this is basically like a way for you to explore the system and to start to feel that each thing is not only a thing, it comes from somewhere, it's made by someone, it's this kind of networked kind of thing that is uh, just here in this particular moment in time and space, and it's also like a, con a conversation about durability and um, temporary things. So again, like the provocation that we have here for you is basically um, to think about materials and their time sp uh, lifespan. So uh, this bedroom, it was basically all put with a lot of uh, concrete-based materials, and uh, we haven't finished calculations, but I have a feeling that it's uh, half of the carbon footprint of the whole uh, renovation project. So um, the sort of one idea that we are exploring and looking at how to build this is to say, should we start to insure, or how you call it, insurance, right? Yeah, should we put an insurance on the carbon-heavy uh, things that are within our homes or whatever in, in our buildings? Which would make com complete sense because if we s uh, spend so much carbon to build an element, then it, we probably uh, want it to serve as long as we want. And if it doesn't, we probably uh, need some sort of way of penalizing that. So we kind of are thinking about this kind of contractual relationships with objects and also thinking about is there maybe another ownership models uh, that we could have for things like Windows or other kind of complex project, uh, products that um, would be really nice if they were, were used more than once. Um, all right, uh, so then really quickly, th this was a well thought part. This is a very non well thought part, but we're still kind of toying with things here. Um, yeah, I mean, again, this, this starts to think about actors and uh, we already have a lot of things that we connected within this apartment to the internet, including like things that measure how much uh, gas we use. And uh, you know, the little um, vacuum cleaner guy that we have is, is seeing the, the place in a certain way. We also built this kind of uh, sensor system, which helps us because it's basically also our office. Um, it helps us to understand conditions in which we work. It was actually shocking, like I figured out that uh, uh, like I sleep in a space that is way too hot and way not humid enough. So yeah, it's pretty, I recommend this to everyone. We basically put sensors in each spot in the, in the space and then we uh, build a system that by a couple of sensors that are static can model this and can un understand what kinds of uh, uh, physical qualities the space has. So like uh, also CO2, um, I don't know if it's proper uh, the tag, but it's like the sort of the, how, how contaminated air is with CO2. I don't, I'm not sure I remember how it's called. Um, yeah, so, so then thinking again uh, about something that um, Cosmos people uh, referenced a bit is this kind of idea, how the space is used, how much it's used. So this is an apartment and uh, uh, office, so it's used like 24 hours a day and we can model the use. We can, um, again, through these things that uh, 
do you remember I was talking about like um, kind of this kinds of things that can uh, relationships can be addressed? So, for example, we have a Wi-Fi router, and I have my phone. So, whenever I come home, it automatically gets connected. So, that's an example of where we can have a like a log of that kind of relationship, which is assigned an address, and we can just uh, see it as a sort of useful information to work with. But also, importantly, uh, we want to play with things. So um, there is this whole layer of aesthetics that we kind of are extremely interested here, especially in the sense that, um, you know, like the, there's this map which uh, is done by Kate Crawford, which is uh, the uh, kind of anatomy of uh, Alexa, which talks about all of the things about it, including where it comes from, what it's made of, what kind of labor it was done with, what kinds of patterns it was uh, kind of um, uh, relying on. And for us, it's really interesting because, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a perfect example of how something can be so complex uh, other than how it looks. So, and, and we face this within domestic spaces all the time, that like, we see these things as Instagrammable kinds of, uh, like, you know, when you have a, if you're an architecture office and you're doing a renovation, you like probably have an incentive to make nice images and share them, but, um, we want to kind of juxtapose aesthetically this kind of coziness and uh, comfort of domestic space and... Uh, oh wait, there's, there's no sound. Anyways, this is just a dude who's doing ASMR home thing. And it's basically like folding socks, but I thought it's very cute. Um, um, It's a pity because the sound is really nice. It's like, you know. Um, but again, like this kind of coziness and cuteness comes together with uh, things like this, which are uh, image recognition technologies that kind of model objects in your home and try to sell more IKEA to you. Um, yeah, um, I mean, again, like we we're, we're kind of looking at the everything game, which is this kind of ob uh, object-oriented ontology thing where you can kind of be everything, you can be a bug, piece of grass, you can be a mountain, an island, or the planet, or I don't know why I'm saying this. Um, any, in any case, I'm, I'm almost done, don't kick me out. Uh, this whole thing is about finding these kinds of uh, relationships between things, and also trying to figure out if there are ways to represent them in an interesting way. Um, so. Just to wrap up, uh, spatial technologies, this us, uh, with, with this kind of a very uh, nice opportunity that we used to come here and present this, we already built this kind of little prototype on top of which we're planning to develop already three things, which are uh, this kind of embodied carbon contract, the apartment as a sort of an instrument to explore different aesthetic regimes and different images and sounds. So for example, we figured out that there's this kind of piece of floor that makes nice sounds here. So we are already making our own ASMR uh, channel, which is automatically generated from the sounds uh, inside the home. And also we're planning to solve the DOMA problem that we uh, encountered in the beginning, which is has to do with this idea of like, you know, like, if the space costs money and we have to share it, what is the sort of, what are the things out there that can help us figure that out? Um, so just to, to finish, um, this kind of mattering story is not just about putting an address on each object within this home. It, that leads you to a question of so what? It's about kind of building these narratives, the stories, the material trajectories to follow and unusual interactions, and that's what we hope to find uh, when we continue with this project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maxime. I, I really wish to, you could have played the ASMR sound, but maybe you can uh, simulate it for us later. <laughs> Uh, uh, pleased to announce the, the last um, uh, studio who will be presenting in the morning session, um, which is MBL Architect, a research-based architecture studio founded in Paris by Sébastien Martinez-Barat and Benjamin Lafour. 
In 2014, they curated the Belgian pavilion at the 14th Venice uh, Biennial. Um, uh, this beautiful, uh, uh, very, very blank white pavilion with this kind of very subtle uh, indications of uh, different sort of interventions from uh, domestic environments in all around Belgium. Uh, and in 2016, they were awarded the Young Architects Prize by the French Ministry of Culture. And two of their built projects were nominated for the Mies van der Rohe Prize in 2014 and 2016. So obviously very big uh, pleasure and honor to host them at the Triennale. Thanks. Uh, I think I will be here. Is it okay? Can I take this? I prefer. Okay. So, hi everyone. Is it working? Yeah. So, um, we are uh, MBL Architect. I am Sebastian. And uh, we, have, um, we are an office based in Paris, actually not really in Paris, uh, let's say in the suburbs of Paris, out of the Paris center. And um, let's say we are a research-based practice. Um, for us, each project is really uh, a new adventure and a new set of, of uh, tools and um, specific to the project. So research means also that we don't really know uh, what uh, we're gonna arrive with at the end of the project. So each project is a really uh, a discovery in this sense. And uh, that's why it's, let's say, thrilling, interesting. And um, one of the consequence of the research-based practice is also eclectism. Eclectism is often a bad word, but uh, if we took it uh, the, the, in, a, in, a good, in a good sense, it means that you are truly in a research process and you don't know what's going to happen. Eclectism means uh, eclectism was format. Does it going to be a building, a design project, an exhibition, a, correct, uh, a book? We don't really know at the beginning. And uh, also eclectism in terms of form. And um, uh, I must say that we are always suspicious with architects with style, and uh, we try to work hard to not have a style, which is really important for us. Uh, also, design in terms of drawing is always something that comes the latest in the, in, the, in, the in the development of a project. So if we have to choose, let, let's say, a, a word to define them, uh, us, uh, uh, will be, we are really into, let, let's say, field work, and uh, fieldwork and theoretical speculation. And both of them are, let's say, part of kind of documentary architecture. So we try really, each process starts with, uh, let's say, fieldwork. Try to see uh, observation and uh, try to understand the reality. So when Joseph and the Triano uh, ask us to present something, uh, a project. We were in the development of uh, a project um, really, let's say, the most uh, empirical one and theoretical one. And uh, we just decided to present what we had at the office at the moment. So you're going to find on the table models, samples, pictures, and some uh, drawings and, um, and mock-ups. So this project starts uh, three years ago. Uh, three years ago uh, in the south of France, southwest of France actually, and in the Basque Country. The Basque Country is divided between France and Spain, or it's here uh, a cross-border territory. And um, a group of citizens uh, gather themselves in order to place a public commission. Uh, and uh, I'm going to quote them. They said, a public commission for a non-intrusive or uh, destructive intervention that will manifest, that would manifest the global warming. And they had um, the proposition has to be positive, not catastrophic. And we were pre-select for presenting something and uh, between artists and architects. And we come up uh, with uh, no drawing and because we don't really have an idea of the territory. And we present more let's say, the method of research. Uh, the, the, we said that we're going to need time to understand the territory. And, uh, 
And this non-design actually approach uh, convinced them and uh, they pick us for develop the project. So I will talk about this project from the, the, the observation part to the, to the end. It's not finished yet, it's still in on construction. So the project uh, starts with the observation. So here the territory. It's a really rich territory. It's uh, uh, between France and Spain, rich in history. It has been important uh, for the each exchange between France and Spain. And also it's a really beautiful territory where you have like sea and the mountain. And um, it's also um, a really touristic territory where you can find uh, a beautiful, really scenic view. And if there is surfer, uh, it's la one of the major surf spots in the world. And um, also, this territory is kind of, let's say, complicated. Um, because of the presence of the mountain, there is no so much space. And, uh, and uh, it's also a territory of uh, transition, uh, where you have a lot of movement of uh, trucks for um, transit of uh, uh, marchandise and um, a, a lot of movement of uh, people also. Uh, it's a territory of migration of animals and uh, uh, people and also it's, um, let's say, what the feeling you have in the landscape of the uh, Estuary, it's um, characterized by a lot of different types of landscape. Natural one, industrial one, uh, agric agricultural one. And um, in a so dense area, there is a lot, of, a lot of things happening. You are in the southwest of France, nearby the sea, but you are more into a metropolitan condition with a lot of movement. And, uh, uh, and also you have an airplane, uh, not, not an airplane, um, um, an airport, an airport built literally on the bay, literally in the sea, in the center of the bay. So you have uh, an international airport, you have three railway stations because it's uh, cross-border territory. So it's a complicated territory. And also it has been, by, it has been really, let's say, uh, modified by a human settlement. A se settlement. Um, the topography of the bay, because it's a bay, here you can see the, the actual model of the three cities surrounding the bay. You have Andai, you have Irun and Ondarabia for the Spain border, and you see the, the airport in the, in the center. And because the topography has been uh, so much modified, the hydraulic system of the bay uh, is, not, is totally disrupted the balance of this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, milieu is totally broken. And you have, um, let's say, uh, more a really visible um, condition, um, effect of this broken balance, which is, for example, the massive flood here, you can see the, preview, the massive flood that are not happening uh, with so much intensity, they were there, they, 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 this is the, the, the prevision of floods were going to happen. Because of the, um, of the diking of the bay, for example, or, or the conquest of uh, marshy land for building uh, um, uh, housing or industrial area, the, um, the sand uh, is uh, filling up the bay. Literally, the, the bay is now full of sand. And which is funny or not, uh, the big beach of Andai, which is the main spot, is just falling apart into the sea. So uh, to one side, we have a bay filling up with sand. And to, uh, to the other side, we have the most, one of the most beautiful beach just disappearing. The sand is go, going under the, uh, in the sea. So we have the, the, the balance is broken. And the balance is broken. And we have two, uh, let's say, uh, visible, we have one major visible effect, this is a classical one, the coast is just collapsing into the sea, as you can see, uh, and uh, the, 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 the rocks are just disappearing into the sea. So this, this territory was uh, kind of complicated. Here you can see the map of the movement, the daily, the seasonal, and the annual movement. And literally in this uh, territory, the, the, the birds 
who, who are migrating are just uh, arriving and uh, niching, I don't know if this is a good word, sleeping, uh, uh, nearby the, uh, staying nearby the airport. And it is it's really weird to see like beautiful rare birds and a huge airplane just living together. It, this is just an example. Uh, here it's a map of uh, unity, uh, let, let's say landscape unity, so it's really a heterogeneous uh, map. Here it's an heterogeneous map of uh, la, the, the landscape, it's really like a broken landscape. So um, we, we did a lot of, um, we did a lot of, um, let's say, research on this territory, so photographic, we we, we, we document the, 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 the territory, and also we, we talk a lot with different type of people, and first of them were scientists. There is a lot of scientists working on this uh, territory because uh, climate change here is really, uh, uh, let's say, change as effect that you can see on a daily basis. And also associative, because there is a strong associative uh, mesh uh, uh, in, the, in the society here, because they are, uh, uh, um, let's say, they want to take care of, 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 the, of the territory. And one of the discovery was that we discovered a process um, uh, in two uh, different reports, scientific reports, that was used for uh, the foundation of uh, Old offshore oil platform for reinforce the, the, the foundation. And um, this process uh, was uh, a kind of um, remaking of the sedimentation process. And we were like, whoa, uh, we can perhaps have here a beginning of a project. Can we transfer this technology, which is really from infrastructure to architectural one? Can we design the monument that we have asked uh, with this uh, process? And uh, tried to, we tried to work with engineer in order to understand this process and also to to see if it was possible to to basically uh, transfer it into an architectural uh, project. So the the process is really simple, and uh, is really simple. The net, it, it used the natural phenomenon of the sedimentation, and um, and we think that. Can we use this sedimentation and carry out the, let's say, the, 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 the joint movement of the ocean of, and the river in order to, to shape the series of monuments that we have to make? Uh, the strict, if we manage to do it, the structure will carry the geomaritime history of the estuary and um, will we'll give a, tangi a tangible form to it. And um, uh, the process, is uh, really, at the end, really simple. Uh, it's based on, um, on a grid system. On a grid system, here you can see a, a little model of the grid don't, that you put on the, um, on, on, on the water, on the, um, on the sea, here on the bay. And um, with a, little, a weak electric uh, power, uh, current, electric current, uh, something will uh, happen and uh, change, the, change the, the grid, the metal grid, into a synthetic rock. Uh, this is a, 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 what we call accretion, accretion or sedimentation. Actually, this is a calcium in the sea will turn to a rock and it will gather uh, with, um, in this process all the particles that is in the sea. It means uh, the rocks. Here you can see uh, rocks. But can, if you look at it more closer, you have plastic, you have uh, a shell, a piece of shell, you have everything that the sea can carry. So this process is really, uh, let's say, uh, it reminds us uh, one of the first drawing on the, after the invention of uh, armed concrete, which was, uh, this drawing was designed by uh, a gardener, uh, Le Monnier. Um, who uh, actually uh, try to experiment with this uh, idea of concrete and uh, uh, slick surface, uh, the grid and the slick surface on the concrete. Actually, what he designed was really into uh, curves and, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, sur uh, slick surfaces. And we're trying to start the project by uh, saying that the only thing that we have to do is to put 
the, the grid, to give a shape to the grid, and to wait that the sea build the monument. So basically, we, we, we work with a, a more a traditional shape of architecture at the beginning, which was like cupola or shelters, and really, let's say, a big uh, structure. And Little by little, the process, uh, we start to do uh, some sample in laboratory. You have a, a, a sample with, uh, let's say, um, ideal sand with a beautiful grain and a big grain, and you see that the, the process is working perfectly. And uh, we do it on uh, just construction mesh. Here it's a plate, here it's a construction mesh. And after we try to understand what we're gonna do, what will happen when we put it really with the sand and the condition of the bay. Obviously, the, the result is not the is not the same, and uh, and um, and uh, the, the the sand is uh, let's say um, uh, not uh, as beautiful as we expected. So uh, um, we 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 work with engineer in order to understand. Uh, if we change the power channel, the, the power, uh, does it work better, et cetera, et cetera. So now we know it will work, uh, but it's a long time process. So we came back to the design, to the design well, what the, the, the monument will look like. And uh, actually we, we, tr we say that the process is the monument because the process is saying all the history of the bay, of the changing, all the and the ornament of the monument will be this sand, which will carry uh, and will show all the material that are in the bay. So, at the, the first starting point it was uh, the second starting point after, after the cupola was more a grid-like system, uh, grid-like system where we. Um, we were uh, actually a kind of instrument of measure of th this process, because during the process, which is really long, actually, is something that I have not said, it takes like months uh, to do it. Uh, it's one centimeter per month, so for, to have 10 centimeter, you have to wait approximately a year to have your monument down. And uh, the design, during the design process, we, de we decide to um, um, just design a grid, actually, as an as-found object, not like uh, an intention design, and because it's also an instrument of measurement. Because during the process, the grid is deformed by the force of the sea, by the force of concretion. And the, this design, actually, this design by the sea is the main purpose of the, of the project. So we have um, a project basically made by the sea. It's literally made by the sea, and uh, we are only make the, condi the good condition for it to happen. It. And also something really important into this uh, construction site, which is undersea and hidden from everybody, actually, it's that it will, um, it will end up by a ceremony of uh, the, the pullout of the sea of the monument. And after the monument will inst be installed in the three city surrounding the bay. They are not really have a function. They have uses. They can be uh, a rune uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the forest of uh, Irun, or they can be, uh, let's say, a bench on the on the on the beach of Andai, or they can be more an arch or a totemic presence in on Darabia. So uh, here, the, the the project actually is really for us um, a kind of manifesto, can say at the end, because is the kind of new alliance between. Uh, uh, let's say, the, the architecture and uh, the, um, the, the, the living, the living beings, actually, uh, uh, and the environment in, in, in general. And also, it's a, an hypothesis, open hypothesis, to an architecture will be shaped by uh, non-human uh, forces. Uh, thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, I definitely encourage everybody to uh, come uh, after the, the presentations and uh, get more intimate look at all the materials because I think um, there was uh, some limitations to what you can see from the, the, the audience and there's just amazing details I think in every project. Um, uh, we are almost, I think, at the end. I uh, would like to open the, the, the audience to, to questions if anybody would like to ask uh, something specific to, to the group or to a specific architect. Um, does anybody have any questions to ask? Yeah. Thank you. Um, these are all really interesting presentations, and thank you. Um, this one's to Maxim, actually. Hey. Uh, uh, that was a really interesting project. I was wondering how you might um, account for, let's say, Existing relations within a domestic space that are also invisible, but whose invisibility is less a question of ontology than politics. Um, so, like particularly um, thinking of questions surrounding domestic labor, whose uh, invisibility, yeah, has been historically produced and has uh, invested interests in being maintained, and whether or not, I guess, kind of the concern would be, which maybe is a concern of uh, object-oriented ontology in general, of like a kind of potentially flat ontology, um, if the aesthetics of information and forensic aesthetics that you're employing might uh, inadvertently kind of reinstate the same kind of black, block, black box logic that you're critiquing in the developer photos, if that makes sense, yeah. I, yeah, I feel like it's a trap uh, because uh, I mean, there's really, I really don't have an answer f to that. I, I mean, we are aware of the, like, the whole like, history of like, like unreferenced, unaddressed, unpaid labor. Um, I don't want to be in a trap. <laughs> what do I do? Um, no, I think, I mean, to be serious, I think the sort of, um, the approach we would take to things that we find problematic and interesting to work through this is that we would take them and play with them and explore them through modeling and case studies and stuff like that. Uh, so I can really speak about things that we've already tried to dive deeper. And again, the, it kind of relates to this thing that like we're trying to develop a methodology to look at these things. So like I, for sure, this whole conversation about domestic labor and I mean, it's also especially interesting here because it's both like a place of production and a place of reproduction. And it's like the sort of uh, gets even more complicated. Uh, so, yeah, I, um, I would just say we will look at that if that's satisfying enough. May I ask a question to Maxim? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I of course can ask it later, but I think it's nice to. To, to discuss it also. I was actually thinking like uh, when you were presenting your project, like what if we kind of fast forward your project and imagine that, okay, we have, you have passed through all this kind of technological complication and you came up with some kind of currency which is equal to, let's say, do, let's say American dollars, but it's applied in the way how like an object has its relationship and its footprint. Would that be then the, the kind of the final outcome of this project? Can we imagine this? I think it's a good question because it's it's also a bit of a trap because the answer is no. Uh, the sort of uh, the, the sort of um, problematics of these kinds of actor network theory things applied to the real world is that they never model the reality to its full extent. It only models what we can describe, and I guess like uh, the trickiness of that is that again like every model that would come to certain currency would only describe things that we made it to describe. Which is also a way for me to say that, uh, on the other hand, there is still hope that because we want to make these connections in the most weird and unexpected way, to the point where the blanket can say happy birthday to the piece of floor, we might find some sort of relationships that are actually unexpected and are not encoded by us. But um, I think we're trying to stay as far as possible from this kind of pragmatic, like, okay, let's like quantify everything and build a model that makes sense. It's like, I, I kind of find this thing about like, uh, example about what I said about uh, ensuring the really carbon intensive thing, it's like almost like a gesture of care and it's much less um, pragmatic than it's aesthetic. It's like, 
like cutie, you'd better stay there for long. You know, you've already done a lot of damage. Let's 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 go, let's go and hide. <laughs> Maybe it's an interesting note also for, uh, I think, Studio Sidiana, for Marianne Van Abel and for MBL Architect, this idea of the idea, the kind of things that the model cannot uh, kind of completely cover or the ability for the design to have some unexpected or kind of unplanned uh, consequences. Um, I'm curious how you guys have either dealt with that within your own practice or how you have dealt with that maybe in um, kind of dealing with a client or dealing with a commissioner and trying to uh, negotiate some space for this lack of knowing while also kind of um, uh, confronting your own maybe practice and your own assumptions with, with you know, the, this problem of the way of working in general in design. I go first. Um, yeah, it definitely comes up a lot when we show a project like this where there's a rather heavy hand of a designer on ideas of what people do and so on. I think for the, uh, there's, a, um, there's a threshold of control in every stage of a project and what gets interesting for us if we think of uh, materials but it extends to other practices is just a bit how far our uh, control goes and our authorship goes over it. With a model it's quite, uh, ahead, there's the imprecisions of the materials that we deal with, there's the clots, there's the translation across different scales, which you then almost take up as a burden to translate when things scale up. So there's an element of uh, uh, translating the scaled models across different uh, layers, but also across different offers. Uh, when we do larger things, we collaborate with uh, manufacturers or with other people. We think there's a lot of unknowns that come from the people we work with. It was quite a big team, for example, working on this, and we recognize everyone's hand in it. Uh, and then there's another side of the work, which I think we briefly introduced this project with the uh, with, uh, birds and with a parrot. And then there's, there's really the thought that um, we are really designing the, the, the language for communication. We're not really designing a program. We're designing the form in which things take place, and we're designing a, the most generous, but also specific platform for certain kinds of encounters. Um, and there's plenty of room for mistake for that, we think, so far it has been. Maybe, uh, yeah, um, uh, Sebastian, uh, yeah, or, or mine, I'll let you. Uh, I think uh, in our practice, uh, the, um, the observation part and the field work is, a tra is trying to, let's say, um, build a common, uh, uh, common basis for uh, all the participants to the project. Uh, it's mean a common intelligence as well. So we do the report and uh, ba basing to this report, we can build a common project. And after, uh, I think that this is really the, the, the main work uh, in order to achieve a project, because after this report, we, we do all to operate. We know how to operate, and we can uh, decide uh, a set of common rules. And uh, often, the common rules uh, are the project. And after life, take the take the take the the project. And uh, it's not a, it's not our job. Let's say. Yeah, it's a nice, interesting thing of the things you don't know or you the things you don't know you don't know but it's um, I mean when developing this this concept for example uh, things about like how to make solar cells for example circular we all know that they are made of rare materials how and until now a lot of people haven't thought about how to, to recycle them and stuff but that's in the past no, no one ever thought or considered about this and that now that's like something being developed now, and uh, they last for 40 years, so that's, there's room for improvement. But yeah, I think there's also kind of like it that you kind of like come across these things you don't know, and then you find solutions. And also, it's the question is I always get okay, so how efficient are solar panels? How what's the price? And that's an old-fashioned question. And I think it's also up to the designer or the industry to like that's like a, such an old-fashioned question. We should push that and like that's that they, yeah we shouldn't ask that question anymore and yeah it's it's interesting you mentioned the um, uh, 
uh, challenge of making the building energy efficient because of the of the data center, I guess, because of this conflict of needing to know and this needing to process yeah. so much information. Well, as Maxime, I think, <laughs> made it very, very visible in the presentation, um, kind of in conflict with this problem of not knowing and maybe making assumptions that then kind of impact quite negatively a future yeah. sort of economy of resources. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was interesting in this project. We did like why are our calculations are wrong? What's like what's happening? And they were super secretive. Like oh yeah, by the way, we have a data center in there. Thing like okay, that makes sense. You know, so <laughs> a bit late. Right? We yeah, and I didn't know it, I was there. So yeah, yeah. Um, I, I guess uh, is there any other uh, questions? Uh, no, I wanted to say something about the um, the solar panels because. Um, Last year, I was collaborating with a, a studio in in Milan, and they they work a lot with uh, sustainable architecture. Uh, so they use sustainable materials, but also this kind of applied technology, such as solar panels and uh, other kind of uh, implants. And in the end, uh, the cost of the building were. Well, like um, always, was always like um, more expensive than a luxury house, on average, because this kind of technology is very expensive in in Italy at least. And another example that I can do, uh, still related to Italy, which is an European country, is uh, that in the south in the south of Italy there's this uh, phenomenon about um, corporate for from the, the the northern Europe they buy. Uh, large uh, fields which were used to for agricultural use and they turn it into uh, solar fields and this phenomenon was, was so in, invasive in, in a way that uh, the, the government decided to uh, regulate it and decided to, uh, to that don't allow to this corporate to, to take uh, too many uh, percentage of, of each region of each area. So, uh, um, I, in, I want to like add um, something to what you said about this technology because also there is a question about uh, disparities. So when you ask the why, why don't we use this kind of technology um, as a standard to build uh, buildings, mm, uh, I maybe uh, in with this kind of um, uh, like I don't know. We, maybe we are relating to a, a small part of the world when we, when we talk about this. Uh, uh, th there is always a question of uh, uh, disparities, which, which is uh, which enlarge when you when you go to a, a bigger scale. We, we can we can talk about uh, uh, the the not Western world where, where maybe the the, uh, the urban uh, infrastructure in general they don't have the possibility to host this kind of technology and also the the production of this technology is very expensive. How do we, do you relate with this? Um, yeah. uh, so you're asking thing? two questions, right? That's also why I spoke about solar democracy. You know, now what you're saying is like kind of like filling out this big landscape with solar panels. You're again putting the power again with like these big corporates. And if you think about like, okay, how much energy would you need yourself in your house and you produce it locally on your own, in your own house in a way that's good for you. And, and then you can have like uh, so, sort of... Uh, um, not bitcoins, but the other world, blockchain, so to like kind of share the energy together. So you really democratize it instead of again putting all the power to this outside outside thing, and then yeah, you have to wave transport it. That doesn't really work. So now we have the choice to really yeah to produce it locally, and also in other countries that is happening a lot, and like how to share this energy and like where to store it. It becomes more mobile solar panels. So it's a lot of development, luckily there. And I think you're. Other question was, um, what was it again? Oh, maybe about the, the uh, you were saying uh, urban centers, maybe not necessarily in Europe, but the. Oh yeah, the, the weight. Sorry, do you know? 
No, we, I, I was uh, trying to say that maybe there, there's a, a sort of dark side behind this, um, the narration of these uh, technologies, which is, uh, of course, I, 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 don't, I don't mean that we shouldn't use uh, sustainable technologies. I mean, uh, but how, yeah. maybe we, can, uh, we have to account of this uh, like more also global situation. I, I was mentioning the, the Northern Euro corporate uh, operate in the south of Italy because they, are, they, they have more economic power so they can buy fields in, in, in the south of Italy and the, um, the person who, um, the, 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 land, the land owners of, of these fields, they, it's more convenient uh, for them to, 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 to sell, to, to rent the, yeah, so the whole and they prefer to stop uh, agriculture in, yeah, in that yeah. sense because it's more convenient <laughs> in terms of uh, earning money. Yeah, so I think like in the future maybe the energy becomes more the sort of the, the our value to, to the way we we uh, we pay, for example, uh, uh, amongst each other. But that's also not a good thing. So um, I think like now how the system needs to change there too. Because if if you think about okay, you buy a house or you rent a house, and it's like you live there for like say 10 years, and the payback time of your solar panels 25 years. That system doesn't then work. So for a lot of people, it's not interested interesting to get access to solar panels. So maybe there could be like other system together with banks or so, sort of to you that, that has a nice collaboration there. So it becomes more accessible for other people and you, pay, you have another payback time, for example, because now it just very often doesn't work. I suppose the interesting thing I think is you said that you really want to work on this subject as an architect and uh, sorry, as a designer and not to kind of just relinquish all of the answers or the solutions to, to engineers or to governments, uh, which I think is a nice point because it means that um, you don't necessarily uh, use the kind of push towards sustainability just as a way of subsidizing kind of new forms of corporate you know, expenditure in order that in the future they will start to produce energy and sell it back to the grid and actually profit massively from uh, this kind of government-funded, um, you know, in development that's taking place now under the guise of, you know, like an, a more ecological system. But it's good to have these conversations all together. So how we, what's got, what's missing now? And we, in the Netherlands, we we set up in this group of all these stakeholders to see like how can we be an example for the rest of the world? And if we put all our power together, and what's missing then? And yeah. Do you want? To <laughs> I think Cosmos wanted to do it. Yeah. Or? I just I just uh, remembered and Artyom also the, uh, what uh, something fantastic was talking about yesterday by showing this SUV that the technology kind of provides so much possibility for us that we start to to do more and more and I think for me it's also very interesting to see how uh, the solar panels which are obviously like an, an evident good how they cannot also bring us that okay if we can do more then we we even have to do even more I don't know like uh, that we, we collect the data, we, we film every second of uh, the time with the cameras and so on, we collect I don't know, uh, all the data. It also produces uh, energy and for this we cover everything. So it's kind of a, um, a vicious circle of, of uh, going higher and higher and higher and higher and just getting a more and more and more smart technology, but then in the end it consumes even more technology. So I think it's quite an interesting discussion. I don't think it's only in solar panels, for instance, in the uh, uh, in Switzerland, there's this Minergy uh, concept, and uh, it updates every five years. And sometimes they demolish or they take out the windows, which are out of date of saving. Um, I don't know. They are not reg reg regulations. So okay, these windows maybe they have some leak of energy, but then to demolish a huge of or demolish all the windows in a huge office building, which was done maybe seven years ago or five years ago, to put new windows. So. Uh, it's a bit ridiculous in order to save like a very little uh, percentage over like maybe 40 years. So I think it's a very interesting general question for all the things which are technologically allowing us to save more energy and to be more sustainable, how not to actually to produce much more by trying to, to run after the technology. So I think it's a very interesting re reflection for me which you have touched upon. And, and you also. I, ju I just want to add as well, it's um, indeed like, well, production of the saving <laughs> energy uh, elements sometimes consume more energy and uh, probably like what at least we kind of observed and learning from different uh, sources like not to use element is the best way to preserve it it's just you don't uh, sometimes like limitation like for example 
the biggest source of way to, like the best way to, so, to, to save energy is like master plan. Uh, you just d design it that way so you don't build what is not needed. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's probably the only way, like when you have to renovate something and preserve, but uh, it's also interesting in our case, um, like a certain moment we had a feeling, I think, that only by putting this like windmills, uh, solar panels, we can achieve uh, the highest energy saving standards, but somehow, sometimes just learning how not to consume isn't better than learn how to consume like less. <laughs> yeah. If you want to come to something. Um, I think we are uh, almost at the end of the time. Do you uh, want to ask a question? Maybe uh, t uh, maybe save it for, for after. I think uh, that you also find the architects kind of staying around uh, a little bit, and, and I'm sure they're happy to uh, discuss their projects. But um, given that uh, there's been a lot of talk about kind of knowledge and sort of forming your own practice, I just wanted to ask a final question um, for, for each person. You know, you can do individually or by studio. Um, but I wanted to ask uh, any kind of a book or a really important source or a tool that you never encountered in your education, but that has been kind of very formative to your practice and you found individually or you taught yourself individually, if you can kind of share with the audience or uh, kind of uh, give generously to us, to uh, all who are still kind of learning how to, to form our own practices within this field. You mean a reference book? Yeah, or uh, it can be like an exhibition you saw or something that really kind of formed your, your approach. Hi, everyone. Okay. Shall I start? Okay, great. So for us, uh, like uh, something that uh, we really didn't find in education was uh, related to material culture and a connection also to production places uh, and the manufactories, for example. So, and we had an education at a, a technical school at the Delft, and uh, it was really, really great uh, to go <laughs> go out uh, after our, my, my studying and. Um, start immediately collaborating with concrete manufacturers like and uh, manufacturers in general uh, because uh, like suddenly like a sort of new world started opening up like this kind of collaboration with artisans and craftsmen uh, and uh, follow every steps of the process for example for the playground or other projects we did in the past uh, was uh, like a beautiful and uh, uh, just to see all the steps, so like uh, the formworks uh, and the put your, in, your, like, your the stones inside yourself, uh, see the casting, see the pieces um, coming out uh, and then installed. I think uh, it was just super beautiful and also this collaboration with the people and, and, and the team uh, of the, these artisans and becomes a project uh, of many at the end. So I think uh, this is really something that I was super excited uh, and uh, now is really part of our Pro all the projects. Mm, I will speak last, I think. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Do you want? Yeah. You asked for one book, and I have it. Um, because I'm super interested, I think it's quite clear, in, like how things work and stuff, and physics. So, also studied yeah, physics, quantum physics. But there was one book that was very clear, it was from the University of Sheffield, and it's called The Solar Revolution. And it's really outlined very clearly all the sort of first introduction, all the technologies, where what, everything was going, and that, that for me that changed my practice. So, well, I would probably like it's quite clear the um, uh, reference uh, for our book which we used. So um, I think I, I can be missing now in, in exact uh, quoting, but I think Venturi started his book Learning from Las Vegas that learning from an existing context is a way to be truly innovative for architect or something like this. And uh, I think that's to us the most interesting. We tried not to focus too much on architectural references, but more observe the way it works like in the context, in the societies, and uh, try to see how uh, our physical interventions which we propose could reflect this, accommodate this, or change in a better way. So I think to us, more like clear observation of the context. Uh, yeah, I think you also said that we can pick not just a book, but general the source of information. Um, kind of the in instrument that I guess for us is the most important, that's what we teach the people who come to the office who are new is uh, looking things up. It's like Google, YouTube. Um, Google. <laughs> no, but um, quite seriously, know. I mean, I think I, also the conversation that we had yesterday about Doma is, uh, was like, I, I was asked a lot after about like, oh, financial derivatives, how can you explain that to architects? And also like here we constantly like dig the things that we don't know how to work with. 
and I kind of think that as designers, it's our agency to do things and to try things. And I mean, I just thought this was a good way to say that like, um, yeah, we basically take things on that we have no idea about and um, YouTube is really good for that. Uh, I was thinking, to, to, to trying to find a book and, and trying to be clever, but uh, actually we have read so much book, see so much exhibition, film, and uh, let's say, been over-educated. Uh, and uh, I have the feeling that the, what is missing actually is the book that uh, are actually the, the education tool that uh, pay attention to the more simple uh, vernacular industrial architecture way of living in the suburbs and the, the kind of banality actually. And uh, that's the, the reality that you're talking about, the, the, the context, even the, where there is no architecture. And uh, I always think that in uh, uh, architecture school, we learn to not love this kind of architecture and uh, this book is missing. Luckily, we have <laughs> a prototype of the edition now. Uh, well, thank you everybody so much. And um, there are, again, two more sessions of, uh, later today. So definitely come back if you are still around. And thank you to all of our uh, uh, participants. You gave such beautiful uh, insights into your practices. And I think hopefully some kind of optimistic reasons to, to continue into the future. So thank you very much again. Thank you.